Fort Sumter, and Abner Devolay fires back at the Confederacy from his cannon. Year after year of bubbling conflict over the issue of slavery, as well as the South's ever-eager abundance of preparation and confidence in their fighters, will now culminate into one of the greatest wars in the history of the United States, with two well-pitted opposing forces that may likely indeed be known forever worldwide as two of the finest armies ever produced. The same soldier who would later become depicted as one of the most foolishly aggressive and headstrong officers of the Indian Wars would first be promoted to the staff of a man whose reputation and legacy would be the complete opposite. In a bizarre twist of irony, Custer would form a long-lasting personal and professional bond with George B. McClellan. McClellan was... <clears throat> McClellan's kind of like your first round draft pick football player right out of college. You know, he, and then he ends up, you know, holding out on you for, for training camp to get more money. And then he shows up and, and he sucks. I mean, McClellan was a good, was a good commander. He was a good organizer, but he wasn't aggressive. McClellan's problem was, I think in the in the movie Gettysburg, I don't know whether Lee ever really said this, but they had a line in there that Lee said, in order to be a soldier, you have to love the army. And in order to be a commander, you have to be able to order the death of the thing you love. And one of the things about McClellan was he hated to send his soldiers to die. Yeah, I admire McClellan a lot, but I also do agree with Lincoln, too. McClellan was a man who wanted to lead a professional army, didn't really understand leading a citizen army, and he wasn't about to take any citizen army into war. He wanted to get it trained up as, as well as the small regular army was, and he would have been fine with that. He wasn't about to risk. He didn't think his professionals could fight. He didn't have much cavalry because he didn't think he had time to train any cavalry that would be worth anything. So pretty much uh, he was a man who would have been comfortable in today's army with a professional force but was not the right kind of leader for the kind of army that we had to raise for that war. So I think Lincoln did the right thing by find, trying to find a general who would win a war before the you know, five to ten years it would take to train up a regular, a regular force. Um, but he was, a, he was a great officer. He was relatively young for his time, a brilliant man. And... Uh, and, of course, uh, I really don't like the way he turned out afterwards, went against Lincoln and would, would have been part of a peace party. Had he won that election, uh, we'd have two nations today and not one United States of America, most likely. So I was very happy the way things turned out. I think uh, Lincoln made the right choice. He had good intuition. He got rid of McClellan. He got rid of Pope. He got rid of Hooker. He got rid of Burnside. You know, so he, he went through kind of the whole Union High Command until he found me, who actually won a battle, and then he got rid of Halleck and put Grant in Halleck's place. And then people always talk about Lee and Grant, but they, they don't realize that, that Robert E. Lee, or that uh, General Meade was still the actual commander of the Army of the Potomac, and Grant just kind of, Grant decided Lee was the most important thing to beat, so he... He gets he gets the credit, but Meade was actually still the army commander. So it kind of it kind of again obscured Meade, who was a pretty competent general. His his nickname was the goggle-eyed snapping turtle, <laughs> and he looked like it. And Meade is another general who really he was the first commander to ever defeat Robert E. Lee in an open battle. And if you think about even Grant never was able to defeat Lee in the same way up until he just beat Lee in a war of attrition, which Lee could never win. But Meade was really the only Union commander that ever defeated Lee head-to-head -head in, in a battle. But because Meade did not get along with reporters, he didn't like reporters, and he wasn't good at promoting himself, he never really was able to get that kind of sexy prominence that some of the other generals 
that he served with did. In this photograph, we see Alfred Pleasanton's headquarters at the Castle Murray. Custer fell into the hands of Pleasanton, who was commanding a cavalry division. Under Pleasanton, Custer rapidly rose in rank, going quite a bit higher than before, and he began wearing extravagant costumes to the battlefield. In this photograph, we see Custer seated next to Pleasanton in the same such outfit of black velvet and gold trim, often topped off with a spectacular red tie for which his soldiers would later adopt into their own uniforms, causing George Crook and others to refer to them, often deridingly, as the Red Tie Boys. Alfred Pleasanton was like a father to me. Uh, he was actually uh, very instrumental in my promotion to the rank of Brigadier General. He had promoted Elon Farnsworth, Wesley Merritt, and I. Uh, at the same time, he recommended to, to General Meade. General Meade had just taken command of the Army of the Potomac, uh, replacing General Hooker. And Meade asked uh, General Pleasanton what was his thoughts uh, about uh, the cavalry. And he infused the idea of uh, young blood being introduced, and we became the boy generals. He, Pleasanton's best thing was he found all those great young officers and promoted them. That was terrific. And he, he could shove aside some of the older Army guys to do what he wanted. He was kind of in the middle. He wasn't an old Army guy, but he wasn't one of the newest guys either. He was somewhere in the middle and was an independent enough thought but he pretty much did what he wanted. Now, he himself wasn't the best operational guy, wasn't the best combat leader. He was a pretty good manager. The boy generals were the youngest in U.S. history. They came distinguished for their reputations as being fierce and brave, as well as tactically innovative, some having one, the other, or all of the above categories, depending on which man. Custer would be praised for both tactics and combat, but with many close calls and sometimes great casualties. Hugh Judson Kilpatrick was one of the most reckless of all. He is credited with sustaining some of the greatest and most unnecessary casualties, as well as taunting and sometimes ordering his officers into taking more risks. Elon J. Farnsworth had been a boy general for all but a few days when Kilpatrick sent him on a suicidal charge against John Bell Hood's soldiers beneath the Little Round Top. The charge was repulsed with the heaviest of casualties, and Farnsworth himself was shot dead with five bullets to the chest and completely immersed in gray. Yeah, Kilpatrick's an example of the real eccentric, and, and probably too much of one. Um, Kilpatrick probably would have been great if Custer was his boss instead of the other way around. He probably had the perfect team. Can you imagine if uh, Kilpatrick was in Reno's place or Ben Dean's place? Oh, yeah. It would have been a very, very different <laughs> a different action. If any of Kilpatrick's horses could still walk, of course. So, uh, Kilpatrick needed to have a calmer head above him that would keep the reins on him until he just needed to be let go at the right time, and then, and then Kilpatrick would have run with it. So it's just a shame that he outranked uh, uh, Custer and Merritt and those guys uh, from West Point because if it had been the other way around, he probably been a, um, did a lot more for the Union War effort. It's rare to find an officer that is first class in both those fields, the management and administration of a force versus the combat leadership force. Some men were, people like Napoleon, Alexander, the greatest officers you can think of in history were the top of their class in both those fields. Um, but most officers who are great are really good at one or the other, and if they're successful, it's because they find people around them that can fill in those things they don't do well. Um, even within the cavalry, you have heavy cavalry guys who like nothing more than to close with the enemy and smash them. And you give them a force, and they're going to get up there and run over anything in their path. And you get light cavalry guys. And these are the guys we call hussars, it, just only because in Europe, um, when they were developing most of our written doctrine today in Western armies, it was from Europe of you know, 16, 17, 1800s. And they call these light cavalry guys hussars. In Russia, they call them Cossacks. Um, sometimes they're called Ulans. In any case, uh, the hussars would prefer to dance around you and shoot from afar and harass you to death rather than roll over you. Um, they're very good scouts. They'll spread out across the countryside and swarm everywhere and tell you everything that's out there. They're good at raiding. They're good at sabotage. They're good at picking off couriers, capturing, gathering intelligence. 
If you need someone to go in and grab a bridge, like a little ranger force would go through, the Hussars are your rangers of the day. They go behind the lines and capture a bridge or town ahead of your main army or a death file. So those kind of guys, unlike the other officers, they need to be bold risk takers because they're expendable, frankly. Um, this is a force, you take these little light forces that aren't your main battle winners, what they are is everything around on the outside that supports your battle, the reconnaissance, the raids, things like that, the, the flank security. And so because they're expendable, they're allowed to take more risks, and you, tr you pick guys that are personally oriented towards taking those risks and doing everything for the mission almost regardless of the cost. Now, they'll do it as well as they can. You, you don't want them to be as stupid as Kilpatrick was, although he was still very valued because he would do just those things, but you could find someone with that much uh, aggressiveness and someone like a Custer or maybe a Merritt or a McKenzie or Miles that will do those kind of things and be smarter about it, have a greater chance of success and a less chance of getting your horse wiped out. Custer probably on the northern side for sure was, was one of, was the best cavalry commander. I mean, Sheridan, Sheridan too, of course, but Custer finishes last in his class at West Point, so so he's not exactly a good student. He contracts VD when he's in uh, when he's at West Point from a prostitute. So he's he's a young, kind of cocky, arrogant your your typical your typical uh, you know, most likely to be a loser scenario, yet he was born to be a soldier. And when Custer got into fighting during the Civil War he was an incredible cavalry commander. People don't realize what Custer did during the Battle of Gettysburg on what's now called the East Cavalry Field was essentially on the third day of the battle during Pickett's Charge, Stuart sent a cavalry attack around the rear of the Union Army, and Custer opposed him so stiffly that he stopped Stuart's advance. And if it hadn't have been for that, you could argue that perhaps Lee's army could have come around and, and wrecked the rear, the rear of the Union Army, and, and the battle could, could have turned out differently. So Custer was an amazing cavalry commander, but then after the war was over, he lost his rank. He was a brevet major general. They dropped him back to a lieutenant colonel. and They dropped him all the way to captain, actually, at birth. Oh, was it all the way to captain? Yeah. Yeah, and Custer, all he's remembered for, really, is Little Bighorn, which... I've been to Little Bighorn once, and it really is a beautiful, if you can say a battlefield's a beautiful place, it's a beautiful battlefield, but, you know, I, it's a shame that that's all he's remembered for, because Custer, Custer was a pistol. Even at the even at the surrender at Appomattox, Custer tried his damnedest to get Lee to surrender to him personally. It just didn't work out that way for him. Longstreet kind of put a foot in his ass. I would say that Sheridan got the got the lion's share of the glory and Custer was just young and impetuous and I think he was looked at as a great commander by the people that served with him but he didn't attain because of I would say probably a lot because of his because of his uh, dandy or they use his one of his nicknames was Audi or cinnamon so you know the guy he was looked at, he was looked at, you know, like Jeb Stewart a little bit in the prissy kind of way. So I just don't think he got the same kind of respect as Sheridan, who was more of just a hard ass. I admired Philip Sheridan very much. Uh, uh, General Sheridan, uh, well, I, sometimes my wife refers to him as uh, Uncle Phil. Um, he and I um, came up with the same kind of... Uh, upbringing. Our backgrounds were very similar. Um, the fact that we had both attended West Point, uh, we had that in our um, commonalities, if you will. But uh, General Sheridan uh, saw early on my prowess in battle and made every attempt to put um, the Michigan Cavalry Brigade and then the 3rd Cavalry Division in the vanguard of the Army of the Potomac. George Armstrong Custer ascended to the charge of the 3rd Division following his performance at the Battle of the Wilderness. At the Battle of Yellow Tavern, a soldier from Custer's 5th Michigan mortally wounded Jeb Stewart. 
you know, Yellow Tavern was really kind of, in the grand scheme of things, the the end of any major Confederate cavalry action on the Eastern Theater. I mean, obviously there was fights and skirmishes after that, but Yellow Tavern really was kind of the, the Waterloo for the Confederate cavalry. It was Sheridan versus Stewart. Sheridan was trying to sneak into Richmond. Stewart got in front of him, and unfortunately for Stewart, he got shot in the stomach by a Union soldier who would end up himself being killed two weeks later at Hall Shock, and uh, Stewart was mortally wounded. He was taken to, I think, the house of his brother-in-law in, on Clay Street in Richmond, where he died uh, before his wife was able to get there to be with him. I think Jeb Stewart was the best cavalry commander of the war on both sides. Um, I think Stewart had his faults, like everybody does, but Jeb Stewart, I believe, was definitely the best cavalry commander produced in the American Civil War, and I think he proved that time and time again. Uh, I think the Gettysburg, where he really got his his reputation, took a, took a hit at Gettysburg, I, you know, I think you could lay as much of that blame on Robert E. Lee with vague orders and allowing Stewart to go off on his own. And you can also give uh, Joe Hooker a little bit of credit for uh, being able to shadow Lee a lot quicker and a lot more effectively than Lee thought he could. And I think you could give a little bit of both of those. But I think Stewart catches the blame because nobody really wants to lay any kind of a blight on the, on the memory of Robert E. Lee. Well, I have to tell you that uh, my foremost opponent through the Shenandoah was my old classmate, roommate from the academy, Tom Rosser, and I think by far he was probably one of the finest uh, cavalry officers in the service, uh, taught him everything he knew when he was there. He was a West Point dropout, a college dropout, if you will, but yet he went on to become lieutenant general of the Confederate Army after the surrender at Appomattox. I didn't see him again until we were up on the high Yellowstone in 73. I was uh, protecting the Northern Pacific Railroad surveyors. He happened to be on uh, that uh, uh, survey up there. He was chief surveyor, and I was under the command of General David Stanley. Uh, for my, my most part, I had uh, many classmates who fought me during the war, and even though Rosser stands out, John Pelham, he was a roommate with uh, Rosser. Uh, Jimmy Parker was my uh, roommate. And he and uh, Stephen Ramser, I, I sat at Stephen Ramser's bed when he passed in uh, the Shenandoah, um, at Winchester. Um, I had uh, experience with a great many of the, the Southern officers having captured them or um, entertained them in my camp after they were captured. It happened that uh, uh, Captain Farish uh, was coming home uh, when I had my headquarters set up in Charlottesville, Virginia. We had saved then the University of Virginia from destruction by some of the bummers and, and some of the uh, renegades that were going to set it afire, so we put up a, a guard post there. and. This uh, particular uh, gentleman was brought to my attention because he was dressed in uh, uh, rags and a hobo-type garment, and he had exchanged uh, clothes with this traveler on his way home. And as he was brought into the parlor of the house that turned out to be his own home, his children ran down the steps to embrace him. So I told him to go upstairs and change his clothes and... I would send him back with a, a note of parole to uh, General Sheridan and hope that there would be some sort of pardon for him. And notice that he was wearing a pair of Persian slippers. He had no boots. And I told him that he couldn't go back and see General Sheridan without a decent pair of riding boots, so I slipped off the pair I had. And they were captured boots that I had captured from a Confederate anyways, but I allowed him to, to wear them back to the lines uh, to meet with General Sheridan. As he left, he said he hated me as an enemy but loved me as a brother. And so uh, there was...
at the Battle of Trevelyan Station, where Sheridan and Hampton would clash against each other in the biggest cavalry fight of the war, Custer came near to complete annihilation. His 5th Michigan Cavalry had found the station unguarded and successfully captured the lot and its assets totaling 800 prisoners, 90 wagons, 6 artillery caissons, and 1,500 horses among the items. But the charge had cut them off from Sheridan, and their pursuit of the escaping wagons took out some of their manpower and lost them much of their loot as well. A duel of the sevenths ensued when the seventh Georgia of the rebels got between Custer and the station, and Custer ordered the seventh Michigan to repulse them. They beat the Georgians back, but Wade Hampton now took notice and sent Tom Rosser's brigade after the station, where they were then united with the approach from Fitzhugh Lee and with Gilbert Wright's and Matthew Butler's brigades. Custer was now opposed from three sides of the station and decided to pull out along Gordonsville Road, but he did not see the Confederate horse artillery battery on the hill to the north. The battery opened fire as soon as he was in range, and he was also getting overwhelmed by Hampton on his right flank. Custer was now surrounded with his command, getting charged on all sides and hit with shells. With the possibility of the end looming, Custer tore his colors from the staff of the flag bearer when the flag bearer was shot down and tucked them into his coat. Sheridan had now heard the firing from Custer and came to the rescue. Half of the 5th Michigan was obliterated and Custer lost 361 men in total. Sheridan asked if he had lost his colors. Not by a damn sight, was Custer's reply. 